going to introduce the speakers now without further ado. And so today joining us on the webinar, we have Keely um, Monroe from the Alliance for Justice. And she will provide the bulk of the elections to do's and don'ts trainings today. We're also joined by Max Boykin and Matthew um, Pagnotti from the AIDS Foundation of Chicago and AIDS Alabama. And they will be exploring um, what you can do at the grassroots level um, particularly as it relates to kind of real-world activities um, in terms of some of the things that we'll be talking about today. And then also we're joined by Tony Christian Walker, also from AIDS Alabama, and he will, ex he will share examples of stories of individuals who have had their voting rights taken away and restored. Um, so I know that many of us work with justice-involved populations, and so this is a great way to kind of understand how we can re-engage them into um, the election process. So I, um, I'm actually going to turn it over to Keely now, um, who's our first person to kick us off this afternoon. Thanks so much. Uh, I just want to do a quick sound check if everybody can hear me okay, or if anyone can hear me okay. <laughs> oh, great. Thanks, the participant Laura. lines are muted, um, but yes, yeah, so anyone who has questions, please, please use the chat box or any concerns or any logistical concerns, so please use the chat box, um, the Q&A sections, and we're able to address your questions there. Right now, the, mute, the participant lines are muted into the Q&A section. Got it. Thank you, Trent. Okay, and um, thank you for also highlighting the question and answer box. In addition to, um, please, please, please be writing your questions into the question and answer box. Um, I'm also going to be asking a couple of times through my portion of the presentation for people to just kind of chime in on their thoughts or uh, you know, a question that I ask. And then the last thing to just note before we get started is I'm also going to use a couple of polls um, to sort of gauge people. I'm going to show an example and say, hey, everybody, you know, is this something that's low risk, medium, or high risk for a 501c3 to communicate this kind of message? Uh, so I'll be asking those kinds of questions throughout as well. Okay, so. Um, Advocacy and election for nonprofits. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Alliance for Justice or Boulder Advocacy, uh, the team that I work on, the Boulder Advocacy Initiative, we work with organizations at the federal, state, and local level to help them understand the laws related to advocacy so that they can, hence our name, be Boulder advocates in the work that they do. We do this in a number of ways, uh, trainings like this, webinar or in person. We also have a technical assistance line, and I want to flag this information in the middle of the screen for you. Um, clearly, nobody expects you to be an expert in what C3s can and can't do in an election year in 30 minutes. So when a question for your organization comes up, um, tomorrow, next week, next year even, we have an attorney on call every business day, Monday through Friday, to answer your questions. That's a free service. We can't provide legal advice or represent your organization, but we do hope to provide you enough information so that you can come to your own appropriate conclusion. Uh, and I really uh, loved the sort of shout out for um, the, the, the required restrictions, the legally required restrictions that funders uh, must put in their grant agreements and those that aren't legally required. I am also happy to talk through what is legally required and what isn't legally required and what kind of language to look out for in your grant agreements at the end if that's something people are interested in learning more about. That's um, a whole other webinar that we do. Okay, so let's move forward. So today, this is what we're going to cover in the next 30 minutes or so. First, just baseline to make sure we're all on the same page. What are the different types of tax-exempt organizations and what are their powers and limitations? What does it mean that a 501c3 public charity must not support or oppose candidates running for public office? How those rules for 501c3 public charities either apply or don't apply to us as individuals who are employed by nonprofits? And then really the, the, the meat of the presentation, uh, for me at least, will be what are the types of activities C3s 
can engage in during an election year but remain C3 compliant and C3 safe. So here's that chart I mentioned. I like to call this advocacy home base um, because, again, it just sort of lays out what the powers and limitations are. Across the top, you're going to see some letters and numbers that, for many of you, you're going to be familiar with, 501c3s, 501c4s. Um, it's actually just the section of the tax code where those organizations' powers and limitations lie. So 501c3s, public charities like the Alliance for Justice, like AIDS United, we are tax exempt. And in addition, we get tax deductible contributions. And I know, I'm sure all of you, like I, get emails every day from allied organizations saying, hey, Keely, listen, we're experts in what we do. Our work is so important. Please donate to us. And when you do, that contribution is tax deductible. That's a huge benefit we get that the other types of tax-exempt organizations don't. But with those powers do come some limitations. We can engage in lobbying, but to a limited amount. Again, that's a whole other training we do. But if people have questions, please feel free to reach out to me after this webinar. And lastly, we cannot support or oppose candidates running for public office. But again, what I hope we really explore today, not only with, with what I talk about, but with all the really fantastic advocates who are going to be speaking, is really what C3s can do during an election year. Uh, the, the last column, 501c4s, which are social welfare organizations, c5s, which are unions, and c6s, which are trade associations, all generally have the same powers related to advocacy. Um, also tax exempt, but don't get those great tax deductible contributions. But they have an unlimited capacity to lobby as long as it's related to their mission and can engage in partisan political activity as long as it's not their primary activity. And in addition to sort of just getting us all familiar with this advocacy home base, the second reason why I like to show this slide is that red and yellow box next to electoral activities. We work for nonprofits because we are passionate about the work that we do. We uh, care about the people affected by the issues we work on. So we get excited when maybe a candidate speaks out or a candidate says something we really don't like. And we see these organizations we work with, for example, like HRC or other organizations tweeting or Facebooking about it, and we think to ourselves, oh, well, they're doing it, so it must be okay for us to share that or for us to retweet that. So that's uh, why, again, I want to just point those two boxes out that, you know, just because an organization that you're an ally with puts something out doesn't mean you necessarily can tweet it out yourself, and that may put you at risk. I'm going to go give you lots of examples of what I just described, but I just want to flag it for you. So nonprofits can and should advocate for policy change. Oops, the little words there got cut off. Um, I love this, uh, this image about Capital Pride 2016. I live here in D.C. Uh, and, you know, I'd love to just see, I know we're going to talk, and we've got a lot of people on the line, but I know we're going to talk through, my, my fellow presenters are going to talk through some of the advocacy they're going to be doing, but I'd love to just hear for any of the participants to type into the question box, what are some activities you're going to be engaging in in voter education and civic engagement this year? Or what are things that you want to engage in, but you're sort of feeling like, <clears throat> what are the best practices, or what should we be thinking about if we want to do that type of activity? So what are you all thinking about doing um, as a C3 to amplify your issues around this election? I'll give people a couple of moments just to type a couple of things in. To lots of people saying voter registration, which is great. We're going to have a whole section. Webinars and town halls, absolutely 100% C3 friendly. 
And Alfonso, just curious, what kind of webinars are you referring to? Candidate guides, great. Love to see that. Voter pledge cards, absolutely. Sharing stories, really fantastic. So, so many different types of advocacy. I love to see that. Sometimes I get on these webinars and people are like, <gasps> we can't do anything. We're just going to stay silent during the election. And it seems like so many people on this uh, call are not. So that's really fantastic. But before we can get to the good stuff and the stuff that we can do, you know, I do want to make sure everybody's clear on the rules. So we know that no 501c3 can support or oppose candidates running for public office. But what does that mean? Well, the, the IRS not only cares about explicit support or opposition, but implicit support or opposition. So let's just look at some examples of what I mean by explicit or implicit. So um, everybody's probably familiar with this uh, headline from early June, and, and now since a couple of days ago, we could even say Sanders endorses, but Obama endorses Hillary Clinton and urges Democrats to unite. Of course, that's something that the president can do. He does not is not employed by a 501c3 public charity. But what if instead it looked like this? Age United endorses Hillary Clinton and urges Democrats to unite. Of course, right? This would be something that would be more risky. This would be explicit support for a candidate. But remember, we don't care just about explicit, but implicit. So are your communications looking like you're giving a candidate the thumbs up or the thumbs down? Could start getting... Um, could start getting uh, you know, into the risky zone if um, you look like you're giving a candidate a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And yes, we're going to talk through more of that in a minute. What if you do? What if you get involved in the election? What if the IRS says you were trying to influence an election, 501c3? Well, here are some of the possible penalties. I would say it's quite rare for any of these penalties to happen. And what I want to note here is that it's not just the possible penalties of the IRS, but putting your organization in a vulnerable place for other organizations, candidates, people who are looking to get your organization in trouble. So just a reminder, you know, we ask you, we are, we're assessing the risk level in terms of IRS penalties, but also important to put in how ready your organization is to deal with bad publicity, you know, how vulnerable you want to allow your organization to be during an election. Uh, this, the, the no support or opposition is for any public office, all the way from the president down to the local sheriff. Uh, for anyone who is fans of Netflix shows or Coach Taylor from Friday Night Lights, um, he was running for sheriff in Bloodline. Uh, he was, John Rayborn was running for sheriff. So a C3, you know, it's risky for a C3 to get involved even at those local level elections, and it includes school boards. And then lastly, we just want to remember that these rules do apply both to print and verbal as well as online. You know, I know at least for us here at AFJ, we sometimes have our interns tweeting or putting Facebook posts up, and we just want to make sure everybody at the organization has a good level of understanding so that um, someone doesn't inadvertently put your organization at risk. But just because your organization cannot support or oppose doesn't mean that it takes away your First Amendment right to, t to speak out in your own individual capacity. So up until two days ago, uh, if you wanted to get your selfie taken with Bernie Sanders, what are some best practices? Well, you want to make sure it's in your own individual capacity, meaning I'm not going to wear the AFJ t-shirt. I'm not going to wear my AFJ button. I'm not going to hand out my AFJ business card at this rally. 
and I'm not going to prepare for my selfie on company time. I'm not going to use my work email or my work computer or my work phone or my work conference room or my work copier. And you want to be safe and ensure that your organization isn't ratifying your acts. What do I mean by that? Well, say uh, Tran is my boss and I say, hey, listen, Tran, um, I, I got to take next Friday off because I really want to go do canvassing for this candidate. And Tran's thinking to herself, wow, we really love that candidate because that candidate's really good on our issues. And she says to me, hey, Gary, don't worry about taking that day off. Don't worry about taking a vacation day. Just go ahead and do that. We'll call it even. That would be risky because it would be the organization essentially ratifying my act. And lastly, have a policy. We actually have a sample policy on our website that your organization can tailor to the needs of your organization. I think it's a great way just to let all of your employees, your volunteers, your board members get on the same page so that, again, they don't inadvertently put you at risk. So let's get to the good stuff now, the meat, as I said. Let's stop talking about the things we can't do and talk about the things we can do. So first is, just because it's an election year doesn't mean you cannot continue to do your lobbying and advocacy work. Many of you who typed uh, your answers into the question and answer box said, I will continue to engage in my lobbying activity during the election year. Just because it's an election year doesn't mean you can't continue to lobby or advocate on behalf of your issues. In addition, you don't have to stop criticizing or supporting sitting legislators even if they're incumbents. But there are some best practices. So. When you want to criticize or support a sitting official for what they're doing, you're focusing on the legislative issue. You're focusing on what they're doing. And here we have an example um, from Positive Women's Network USA saying, tell Congress, fund HIV. This is a call to action as a senator in the legislative capacity. And it's obviously continuing ongoing support or criticism. Why? Because we know Positive Women Network in uh, USA works on HIV AIDS issues. And we're not supporting or criticizing uh, personal characteristics of the sitting official. So just to highlight again this distinction, so here we have from California the example of Kamala Harris where a C3 could safely engage with Kamala Harris in the top example as the California Attorney General. You could, and this is a Facebook page, so you could like things, you could comment, you could post articles because this is Kamala Harris in her official capacity as California Attorney General versus engaging with Kamala Harris on her Facebook page for U.S. Senate would be, could look more, could be more risky if it looks like you're giving preferential treatment to her over other candidates. So, here we have a couple of examples, and I'm going to uh, employ those polls for the next three slides. So here we have an example from Stigma Action Network saying, Hillary Clinton says she'll work to reform hashtag HIV criminalization laws as president. Stop the spread of hashtag HIV, hashtag stigma. Now, for you who are, are um, who are, participating, would you think this is a, a low, medium, or high risk communication for a C3? Low, medium, or high risk? Go ahead and click, or I don't know if you don't know, which is fine. Great. So, should have started with a more positive one. I hate to be a little bit of a Debbie Downer, but this I would 
say actually could be a risky communication for a C3 to share. Why? Well, this was posted on May 26th of 2016, meaning this organization is speaking out as Hillary Clinton in her presidential candidacy status. They're not speaking out in her formal status as Secretary of State, although it does say former Secretary of State, but then says Democratic candidate for president. Uh, they're not speaking out as a former senator. They're speaking out on what she said as a presidential candidate. And for a C3 to share this could look like preferential support for one candidate over the other. But what about this? Thank you at POTUS for your commitment to ending the hashtag HIV and hashtag AIDS epidemic. Low, medium, or high risk? Yes, absolutely. Everybody's 100% on point. Why? Because we're engaging with the president in his official capacity, posting him at POTUS, you know, the the the. the, the Twitter handle. And also, uh, well, he's not up for re-election. Even if he was up for re-election, this would still be a very C3 friendly tweet. And then lastly, what will hashtag HIV prevention look like under President Trump, question mark, bleak, question mark, at real Donald Trump, at HIV PR research, at CDC HIV AIDS, hashtag Trump 2016, hashtag God help us all. Yes, most people are, are have got it. A high risk, why? Because you're it's it's implicit and almost explicit in this tweet of uh, opposition of a candidate for public office. So again, really highlighting the distinction between speaking out at, for someone in their official capacity, their sitting capacity as a legislator, as an executive official, and speaking out about them as a candidate. But I hope, as you know, and I mentioned before, that doesn't mean you can't engage with candidates at all. And we're going to go through some of those activities in a moment. Um, now, what if a, a, a candidate says something so egregious or so great that you have to respond? What are some best practices? Well, um, you want to continue to focus on your public policy issues and not the candidate. So you're focusing on the issue that you work on, not which candidate said it. You are not commenting to influence the election, but more commenting to lift up your issue and the the you the expertise you have in the issue try avoid mentioning the name of a of the candidate and not criticizing personal characteristics so what does that look like i know it seems like that's a lot of things that we have to be aware of but here's a great example from the aclu saying Barring a group of people from entering our country based solely on their faith is blatantly unlawful and fundamentally un-American. We are a nation of immigrants, many of whom came to this country to escape prejudice and discrimination. We urge all of our political leaders to categorically reject this dangerous escalation of hateful rhetoric. This is a great example of a C3, to be fair, the ACL uses C4, but this is a, still a C3 friendly message to speak out about the issues they care about. They are probably actually commenting or responding to something a particular candidate said, but they are not naming the candidate. They're focusing on their issue. What about legislative scorecards? I saw a couple of people um, mention scorecards or voter guides. Also something that's a very C3 friendly thing to do. Um, the IRS has provided two safe harbors. It's being sent to the public. You want to publish your legislative scorecard regularly. Include all legislators. And you want to time it so that it's timed with the legislative session, whether it's right after the legislation, legislative session, right before the next legislative session. You want to make sure it's on a broad range of issues. By broad range of issues, we look at more, three or more. And avoid making commentary on how legislators voted. 
but if you're sending it to your members, members defined as anyone who spends more than a nominal amount of time or money to your organization, you also have to publish regularly, include all legislators, but it can be on a narrow range of issues, and you may have commentary. So what about this? Again, one more poll. Um, the CHAMP and CHOMP chart from Planned Parenthood. Here's a quick look at where the 2016 presidential candidates stand on three of Planned Parenthood's top issues. Do you think this would be a low, medium, or high risk communication for a C3 to put out? Low, medium, or high risk? All right, so we've got most hot, most hot a couple of lows, a couple of mediums. So this, again, remember what we're thinking about when we're thinking of a legislative scorecard. It's on sitting legislators. So this actually would be a risky type of guide to put out from a C3 because you're rating the candidates. You're saying to your supporters, those people that get the green check marks get the thumbs up, and those that get the red Xs get the thumbs down. Uh, and the, the last piece before we get into voter registration and voter engagement is candidate education, a great way for C3s to engage with candidates to say, hey, we understand you are not an expert in our issues. Let us educate you. But you want to make sure you offer it to all. And you only use what's already gathered and create new information if your organization has another reason to do so. Now, that's a mouthful, but what I mean by that is you offer to all, even if you know that everybody will take advantage of your meeting, and say after you have the meeting, uh, someone from the campaign calls you up and says, whoa, Keely, we loved what you were saying. Can you write us some talking points uh, for our next campaign speech? If it's not something that you would share to anyone who requested it, if it's not something that's publicly available, that could get a little risky because you're giving preferential treatment to one candidate over the other. That's not a common situation. Uh, you, the only situation I usually see it in is when people have sort of polling data that um, – that they haven't shared, like in-depth in polling data that they haven't shared with other people, they haven't made publicly available. But, you know, great way to educate candidates on the importance of your issues. Uh, I saw many of these when people were chiming in about the activities that they'll be doing this year, candidate questionnaires, debates and forums with candidates, candidate appearances, and then a little piece that I usually talk about, about appearances unrelated to candidacy. Now, if you are thinking about doing any of these types of activities and have a couple of questions on them, one, feel free to ask them during the question and answer period, or two, reach out to me afterwards and we can talk through those best practices. Um, unfortunately, just with the time crunch, we're not able to go into it in depth right now. So with voter registration and GOTV, uh, just a couple of best practices. Uh, they seem pretty common sense, but great as reminders. Um, when you're doing your voter registration, no reference to party or candidate. So something like rock the vote would be obviously something very C3 friendly to share versus how to vote for Bernie in California would be something risky for a C3 to share. You don't, you're not suggesting who to vote for. Here are some great examples from Sister Love and Age United saying, get on it. Today is the last day to register to vote. Make it happen. Or today is National Voter Registration Day, how your vote can affect the future of HIV AIDS policy and advocacy. So they're saying just go vote. It's important to uh, that your vote is your voice. But they're not saying, oh, by the way, when you register to vote, here's what party you should register with or who, here's who you should vote for. You want to make the service available to everyone. Um, I just had to throw this picture in because once upon a time, many years ago, I worked for a short amount of time for AIDS Action in uh, AIDS Action Boston, and we did lots of tabling events and I think maybe even some voter registration. Uh, and you know, if someone comes up to your table and has a very 
offensive shirt on or says something rude, just because you don't like them or you don't agree with their values doesn't mean you can refuse the service to them. You have to let them register to vote even if they say something ridiculous or something that you disagree with. And then the last thing as we wrap up, uh, targeting for nonpartisan reasons. When you're out there canvassing, you absolutely can target communities, but in a nonpartisan manner, meaning targeting the communities you already work in, targeting communities who are historically underrepresented, like communities of color, immigrant communities, young communities. Uh, but ensuring that the reason why you're targeting is for a nonpartisan reason. And then the last um, two slides, I just want to do uh, uh, two quick more polls saying, you know, here's a, a great message, voting matters, register to vote, find out more, ending the HIV epidemic starts at the voting booth. Uh, low, medium, or high risk for everybody out there? Yes, absolutely. Low risk. Why? Because this organization is just saying voting matters. That if we want to end the HIV epidemic, we have to start at the voting booth. Very C3 friendly message. But what about this? Say you're, you're at a, an event for your organization and you have these buttons on, I'm with her, low, low, medium, or high risk. Yes, absolutely. High risk. You don't want to look like you're giving preferential treatment or signaling to your supporters who they should vote for. And then just the very last thing, um, you want to make sure that, uh, there, that you aren't providing incentives for voter registration or GOTV, like providing pizza to people who register or entering them into a raffle. Uh, and if you want to read some in-depth publications on tax law, Influencing Public Policy in the Digital Age and Rules of the Game are where you can find all the information I talked about today. Uh, I'm based here in D.C. My colleagues, though, uh, I have colleagues in, in Dallas, Oakland, and L.A. If any of you are in those cities, feel free to stop by our offices. Uh, and looking forward to questions during the discussion period. And I think with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Max. Thank you so very much, Kelly. Hey everybody, I'm Max Boykin. I'm the community organizer here at AIDS Foundation of Chicago. I also uh, manage the HIV Preventive Justice Alliance. Um, and I'm going to talk about kind of like how we've uh, came up with a way to come about talking about voter registration and voter engagement um, in this year's election cycle uh, from a way that a 501c3 um, that works around HIV and AIDS, like what does that have to do with, with, with voting? Um, and, and the thing that I, I, I kind of thought through as a, I am a young black person, uh, I wanted to actually talk to the demographic that is actually affected by, but I wanted to think about, well, how do I talk about HIV and AIDS to young people and voting? Um, and I said, well, voting to me affects who and how we have sex. And that has to be brought up and understood for people. Um, and then how do we connect this issue or something that I, a lot of people do have fun with, enjoy to talk about um, at times is talk about sex. And how do we connect um, who and how and these legislations that, we, that Kelly were able to talk about, how do we talk, connect legislations um, to the voting and like actually, you know, the way that we have sex. And I kind of came up with a campaign out of it. But uh, at first I want to talk about kind of like the demographic we're trying to reach. Next. Yeah, so it's, I want to talk about the demographic, right? Um, we're talking about young black queer people, um, specifically uh, black um, men who have sex with men. And how do we, how do we, how are we talking to them about something that um, a lot of people believe, oh, young, young, especially young black people don't vote, um, young people don't vote in general, um, but they do. Um, out of any young population, young black people voted the, voted the highest amount in 2012 um, and also in 2008. Now, we definitely understand that a part of that uh, came with uh, President Obama, uh, but when we're talking about uh, just the voter engagement process, also uh, young black people 
specifically believed that the ability to make a difference through political pr participation was higher um, than their, their white and Latinx um, counterparts. And that's something important to understand um, and also had a greater, greater voter turnout at 46 percent um, than, than white and Latinx um, as well. Uh, but in general, they also have a general alienation to, 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 to feeling like uh, people that are running for office or the people that are um, representing them actually care about them. Uh, and when you're in a presidential cycle such as this one, uh, that could only make it, make it worse. So understanding that, but understanding that we do have issues and something that just got passed like gay marriage, um, we could talk about the history of that. We can also talk about so many other things of like legislations on such as things as PrEP, um, uh, uh, capacity to be able to get birth control uh, in the way that people need to have it. Those are all things that we can talk to young folks about, about why it's important to go out and vote because actually these people that are elected people in office actually affect how they're able to deal with it. So um, we can take that information that we have here uh, and take it into the next piece, which is my next slide which is um, kind of what we're talking about our campaign is around. It's um, the voting for our sexual liberation. Um, we take it from a voter engagement and voter registration piece. Um, voter registration is definitely truly important. Um, there are plenty of young people that are still not registered to vote, um, and we want to challenge them in this. But we also want to engage them. Um, it takes about uh, 10 cycles to get someone from just registering to vote, 10 different contacts to get from someone from just being registered to vote or non-registered to vote all the way to actually going to the voting booth. Um, and so how are we engaging people that have already registered to vote, or already saying they're registered to vote? That's where voter contact cards came into handy. Um, and uh, we use those on election cycles, but also I've, I've seen nonprofits use it. And that is where Worker Chicago Votes comes um, in handy. Chicago Votes is another 501c3 here in the city of Chicago that does uh, strictly voter engagement and voter education. And I had friends that had already been working with them, um, but also had worked with them in the past, and was like, okay, how can we, how can we bring this together, and how, what do we bring to them, uh, and what they can bring to us. Um, and they have groups of canvassers that have already been doing voter engagement, uh, voter registration at high schools, um, at uh, youth youth events across the city. And what they're mainly to do is get young people out to vote. It's like, this makes sense for us to partner together. So, um, and they also have something that, that we do not have access to, which is the Voter Access Network, um, which campaigns use, but also um, 501c3s use as well in order to make sure that they're just getting accurate voter information. That's where your voter registration can go in um, as well and just saying, oh, I've contacted these people um, or the, and adding these people to the system. Uh, what we bring to the table, though, is we're talking about something that they normally don't talk about, which is sex. Um, people aren't normally talking about sex, um, but it's something that pe like young people like to talk about at times, and it's fun. Um, it's interesting to bring up, and, and it's kind of like a quirky way to, for someone to come um, talk about like, hey, um, did you know that uh, if you don't vote, like, that can affect, like, who you can have sex with? Like, if you just, like, say that to someone, it, it at least sparks their imagination. Um, and if it doesn't, in that way, um, it at least sparks a conversation that people can start to have. And then we uh, kind of take, like, a, a comprehensive voter education uh program and kind of, like, slice it down to digestible chunks where you can do it during, in a, in a street teaming fashion. So um, street teaming by other people consider canvassing. Street teaming is more um, where you're at a cool event. The one great thing about Chicago is because it's so cold over the winter, there's like a really cool event to do every day in the summer because we will have to get them out of the way in the next two to three months. So uh, when we're doing that, we, it gives us a lot of chance to actually uh, have events to go to. And then also when school starts back up, having the chance to go to um, high school programs or after school programs and talk to them about why it's important for them to go out to vote uh, for senior classes is just really important to talk about. And that's where like the power of street teaming um, and canvassing in communities actually helps to talk to. Um, that includes uh, talking to folks on the, on the trains. Um, we have uh, train things. And this is where you're not just talking to young people. You can be talking to everyone um, about why this is important. Um, and you're getting not just young people, but important to, to focus on getting young people engaged, but do a train tracks, events over the summer, um, important like um, 
uh, downtown areas that are like really congested with people coming through and it just gives them a chance to really talk about it and you're not asking them for money you're not asking them um, to do something like way out of their hand it's actually just committing to say that you're a, a voting um, and you can be uh, what we consider uh, a champion for, 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 for these issues that we're talking about right there and that's also where we can get into the network blast um, when you're talking about sending out a network blast um, we came on the diet of them being like HIV champions. Um, I, I talked to a person who'd been doing voter work much longer than I had, and he's like, well, yeah, we, we make people, we can send it out. Like, you're not just at, where well, you're asking not just your friends um, and your family, but talk to five or ten people around you and gauge them to come out to vote. Um, and that, once you have those five or ten names, um, and, and make sure that you're calling them, engaging them about voting, and also to send, uh, send away about assistance so we can contact them and remind them about voting as well. Um, and that just adds to your network, one that adds to your network in general of the people that you can reach out to, but it also adds to the network that is getting reached out to go out to. And those people that are your, your core people that are already on your email list um, or already coming to your, your core group of volunteers, that gives them something to do. Um, a lot of times for us, like we have people that have done amazing advocate work, but they haven't really had a ch um, when, when things are out of session, they don't have their legislators to meet with as much, what can they do? And that's like making sure that they encourage uh, people to vote because um, your vote does count, it does matter, and we want to make sure that people are using that time to really engage people. Um, that's a great thing to do over the summer and then going into the fall. Um, and, and to definitely, it, it's a way to keep it away from like candidate base. It's not something that's focused on Democrat, Republican, or anything like that. You're actually just working to uh, make sure people are actually going out to vote. So uh, that's what I have. And looking forward to questions in the, um, in the, in the question and answer section. Next, uh, we have Matt. Awesome. Thanks, Max. Um, hey, everyone. Good afternoon. So um, I'm the Civic Engagement Coordinator with AIDS Alabama, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the policy implications of why ASOs and nonprofits in general should be engaging in voter mobilization work, especially in the context of doing that work in the Deep South. And then highlight some strengths that ASOs in particular have uh, around voter mobilization that we can leverage and kind of show people what that looks like for us here on the ground. So a little bit about AIDS Alabama. We've been operating for 30 years in the state. We provide energy and resources statewide to support people living with HIV or AIDS and help them with healthy and independent lives. Uh, we provide a number of wraparound services. Um, and we've really been ramping up our advocacy work as well in recent years. Uh, we have we're the largest ASO, um, AIDS service organization in the state, so we work and network with eight other ASOs, I believe, um, throughout the state to have reach everywhere else. So Alabama, of course, has a long history of suppressing the vote, particularly for marginalized populations. Uh, I'm just going to kind of delve real briefly into the recent history of it, because that is what's most pertinent right now in our work. Um, 2013, we had the Shelby versus Holder case, which came out of Shelby County, Alabama, which is neighboring where I'm giving this presentation currently. Uh, that made it to the Supreme Court, striking down the pre-clearance section of the Voting Rights Act, which allowed states like ours to pass voter restrictive laws without having to go through the Department of Justice first, which is what used to happen. Um, there was already a photo ID law that our legislator had passed prior to that court case that they were sitting on. Um, immediately put it into effect as soon as that decision came down, so it was in place for the 2014 elections. They put in a new uh, redistricting plan that's been ruled to be a racial gerrymander. Um, and then this last year, as you all probably saw on the news, our law enforcement agency um, initially planned to close down almost all of our DMVs, most of which are we're going to be in rural counties that have a higher concentration of communities of color. Uh, there was a big backlash on some uh, on TV networks, and so they've agreed to reopen them. But what that really looks like on the ground is many of these offices are open one day a week or one day even a month uh, for only a limited few number of hours. And even though the state said that they're going to provide free voter IDs, you know these are really difficult to obtain. Um, they've only given out 1,500 last year, for example, and over 250,000 people who are, are eligible voters um, have 
not been able to get those I, those IDs. Plus, they still cost money to get because you have to have other documents, and you still have to visit the DMVs that are being closed down. But, um, now, Alabama being in the Deep South, we exist in the heart of the HIV epidemic. So um, through these statistics here, you can kind of see that there's a lot of overlap between communities that are being targeted by voter suppression and communities that are also bearing the brunt of the HIV epidemic. Uh, we know that here in our state, most of the people living with HIV are earning, on average, income of $10,000 or less. Um, so we also know that most of the new cases of infections are happening among communities of color. We know that in our state, our epidemic is more rural, um, so areas outside of urban uh, populations, and there's a disproportionate number of cases among LGBTQ people. The implications for this for policy uh, and why we should be engaging in voter mobilization work. So our legislators refuse to expand Medicaid, and in fact this year we have underfunding from Medicaid and our AIDS drug assistance program. We had attempts last year to further criminalize HIV. Uh, in the last several years, there's been an increase in anti-immigrant legislation rhetoric. Um, the, last, the legislator this last session has also blocked attempts from Birmingham and other cities to increase the minimum wage. And there's been a general lack of LGBTQ protections and harmful rhetoric for some of our state leaders. So with that context in mind, this is why AIDS Alabama has really begun to get involved with voter engagement and see the importance of it. So uh, local communities is our umbrella work of civic engagement programs, which runs from everything from town halls to our new voter mobilization strategy, which has a three-part process. Uh, voter registration, so registering our community members and stakeholders to vote through direct service or outreach events or online. Educating voters, and this means uh, helping them to navigate the voting process, which can be really tricky, even in states that aren't like Alabama, that are aggressively suppressing the vote. So providing fact sheets and handouts, um, engaging in social media campaigns to let people know about deadlines, uh, and running workshops uh, for Know Your Rights. And getting out to vote. So uh, having voter pledge cards to encourage people to make it to the polls, reminding people with follow-up messages that uh, hey, voting's coming up soon. Do you need a ride to the poll that we can provide? Um, and helping to make sure that no shady business is happening at polls. So connecting people to hotlines for voter protection. So um, talking now about some strengths that we have as an ASO and the ASOs have in general, they can leverage for voter engagement. Um, there's the linkage to care model, which is a process of how people living with HIV can get entered into treatment. Uh, after they diagnose and how we maintain them in care. And that uh, actually there's a really powerful model for voter engagement as well. Um, similar to the linkage to care model, you have a community member who can engage with a staff member on, um, on voting and issues about civic engagement. And then that staff member can assess what level of engagement that community member needs. Um, so maybe they're registered, but they don't know how to find their polling place. Then you link them to a place where they can get that resource, so going to you know, alabamavotes.gov to look their polling place up, and then helping to maintain communication and engagement. Um, hey, let's have you fill out a pledge card so we can follow up with you and give you reminders about when the election's coming up. So uh, what does that actually look like on the ground? Um, for us here at AIDS Alabama and in general, um, that can include training our staff on voter engagement so that they can provide those services um, and really kind of weave it into the direct services we already provide. Training social workers and peer mentors and our prevention trainers uh, and testers to be able to have those conversations when they're already engaging with community members uh, around other services. Uh, it also means providing assistance for a wide number of voting resources, so registering folks to vote. Uh, helping connect them to people who can help them obtain IDs, um, providing transportation to the poll potentially on election day, uh, helping to restore both voting rights, uh, and just including a number of other wraparound services. And kind of thinking about that as a wraparound service that we provide to our community. Um, and finally, that also means referring our community members to partner organizations that can fill in the gap, similar to what we do for um, health services for people living with HIV. So that can mean if they need legal help, connect them to the ACLU or NAACP, for example. 
Um, community outreach is another really uh, another powerful strength that ASOs have. We have a familiarity with an array of community outreach events uh, and methods. We provide you know mobile testing, um, go out to communities frequently, and there, like I said before, is a strong overlap between the communities that are being impacted most by the epidemic and those that are also being targeted by voter suppression. So we're already out in those communities doing other work, and it's really easy for us to leverage that existing relationship that our stakeholders trust us to be working for them and helping to support them. So what it looks like on the ground, um, utilizing those prevention and outreach events as spaces that we can engage stakeholders around voting. Um, having booths next to our testing booths that have voting registration forms and resources and handouts. Um, it means including that as the services we provide in our normal communication channels. So when we're telling people about a testing event, also including that, hey, we'll be registering folks to vote during it as well. Um, and it means setting up registration drives and workshops in the communities that we serve. So if we're doing an advocacy event for for youth, or if we're going to be talking to um, people who have a conviction history, we can be doing a workshop around restoring voting rights as well. Um, and our final strength I'm going to talk about is advocacy is a core value. There's a strong history within the HIV advocacy movement of organizing and mobilizing people around um, policies that they really need and getting people engaged. Uh, we have uh, commitment to MEPA, which is the Meaningful Involvement of People Limited with HIV and AIDS, which is really important because voting is a powerful tool for uh, empowering people and meaningful involving them in their government and policies. So you can really use voting and HIV both as a lens to see the intersectionality of systems of oppression. So what that looks like for us, it means discussing voting as a means of self-advocacy and empowerment when we're talking about MEPA as a concept and meaningfully empower, uh, empowering people with HIV, including voting as a way that they can do that and making sure that we stress that. It means adding voter mobilization to our calls to action. So not just, hey, uh, call your legislator, but really encouraging our communities to go out to vote, to find ways to register to vote, um, and providing help for that. And it means leveraging our already existing community partnerships to help mobilize people. Um, reaching out to, for example, we work really closely with um, HRC, ACLU, uh, the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, um, working to knit together community resources. And that's all I have. So I'm now going to pass it on to Tony, who knows more about what this looks like for people on the ground and some personal narratives. Hey, good afternoon. How y'all doing? Um, well, this um, voter, uh, felony voter rights registration idea came from the fact that when I first started as a civic engagement coordinator, which is the job that Matt currently has, um, it was right after the elections. And in trying to expand Medicaid in Alabama, it seemed like a moot point for the simple fact that the elections were already passed. And if you were going to get Medicaid expansion passed, you would have to get it, um, people voted in. It was too late for that. So I decided to take the route of engaging and informing people of how important their votes were in order to get our, our elected officials listening to our voices when it came to Medicaid expansion. So I started off by doing some surveys at the HIV clinic here, the 1917 clinic, and this whole process was born out of, I guess I would call it deep-seated anger. See, I would go in and ask people, you know, which elections did they vote in. Of course, most people say they voted in the federal elections. Um, fewer people voted in the state elections and even fewer in the local elections, which is the exact opposite of where, where it needs to be when you're in a state like Alabama. So as I asked these people why they didn't vote, I started noticing that when I asked them about voting, the, the responses I got were just angry, like, well, I just don't vote. And I'm like, that's kind of pointed just for asking about voting. And I decided to ask this one lady about why she, well, why are you so angry not voting? And she disclosed to me that she had a felony. And that started me on a line of research. I did a little research and find out that one in 13 African-American males in the state of Alabama have some type of felony in which 
it disenfranchises them from the voting process. So it made a little more sense to me now when I asked people if they, did, if they voted and their responses were angry. They weren't voting because they were upset with the system or think that their votes didn't matter. They were, vote, they were upset because they literally could not vote due to having a felony. So the, I decided to figure out, according to our state laws, and keep in mind every state law, every state has different laws. So according to our laws, if you have a felony in the state of Alabama, you could not vote. So I kind of developed these three goals. First to determine whether or not the crime that the person had been convicted of terminate their right to vote or not. Then find out how their votes can be restored, their voting rights can be restored. Um, and then provide instruction and assistance to them on how to get their voting rights restored. Uh, in addition to that, I want to also let them know why their votes were important. Um, again, we live in a very, very red state. And uh, people who are more liberal minded really don't think that their votes matter. Well, on the grand scheme of things, your vote always matters. It's harder to see in the presidential election. But when it comes down to your city council people, sheriffs, DAs, it's very important. So if I had to explain to them that it gave them a say in how they're governed. Uh, it let the elected officials know that they were engaged in the process. We all know that political officials pander to people who vote. So I wanted them to know that they could be a part of the pandering. Uh, and also that their vote matters in every election. Uh, okay, so in order to get their rights back, we had to determine whether or not they had lost their rights to vote. In Alabama, for all the bad things that go on here, we are really like jumping into the electronic age uh, full force. Uh, so there is a website called alabamavote.gov in which you could actually see if you're registered to vote. It will show you your register, your polling places, uh, and um, let you know whether or not you're actual, actually able to vote. So the first thing I would do was, would be to find out whether or not they had lost their, their right to vote. And if they have lost their right to vote, next slide. I had to find out how to get their rights back. So in Alabama, you can get your rights back if you have fulfilled your sentence. And fulfilling your sentence at that time meant paying all of your fines, court costs, uh, victim restitution, uh, and served your time. Since then, and there's another slide at the end, um, we're not going to worry about it, but there's another slide at the end that shows that that has changed a little bit. They've actually changed the where that as long as they've com fulfilled their obligations for the sentence, the one sentence that got their voting rights taken in the first place, they could uh, get their rights reinstated. But once you got your, your rights, once you fulfilled your, your sentence, um, then we have to look at what the sentences were, were as well. So in Alabama, there are some prohibitive felonies. And the prohibitive felonies are the ones that are going to take you a little bit more. So those are things, excuse me, like murder, treason, impeachment, rape, and the last one I call the little sexual stuff that you shouldn't be doing with kids. Uh, those things require that you get a pardon. Pardons are much harder to get, but as long as your felony did not include those, that list right there, it was fairly easy to get your voting rights back once you completed your sentence and paid your restitution. Next slide. So what I found out through research was that the ACLU in Alabama actually made the process really simple. This uh, serve application um, basically is certified the eligibility for their right to vote. The, the former felon will fill this form out, mail it into the ACLU, and they will handle the rest of it for them. Basically, once you fill this form out, in 45 days, they had to give you a yay or a nay on whether or not your voting rights have been restored. Uh, effective this year, as I said, they changed the fulfillment um, requirement to just the disenfranchising offense. And also, they took the, day, the time limit down from, 14, from 45 days to 14 days. So basically now in the state of Alabama, if you have done a felony that's not one of those prohibitive felonies, and right now we know that in our state 
the 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 most of the felonies that people have, especially African Americans, are all around drug charges. So even those people with those drug charges now can actually get their rights back fairly easily. And with that, we were able to get them back into the um, in, in, into the voting room. And that's it for me. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, for the participants in watching the presentation, I will now unmute the line, so that way we can participate in the question and answering section. Thank you, everybody. And if, thank you, everybody. Um, that was a very enlightening and informative um, presentation. I know that I've learned quite a bit. I also know that I have quite a few questions, and I'm sure that others who um, are on the webinar do as well. So again, and the lines are now open, uh, and also if you have questions um, that you don't want to articulate, feel free to please include them in the question and answer box on your screen. So Keely, I have a question. Um, so in terms of what do you, what are some of the biggest impediments that nonprofits have in kind of dipping their toe into this work that you've experienced? Uh, I think really just being too risk averse of what they can do. So I really encourage all the organizations on the line who uh, both typed in the great work that they're doing or, or maybe are not sure what they want to do this year, don't feel afraid. I mean, these three presenters are talking about really fantastic integrated work that they're doing around voter engagement that is 100% absolutely C3 friendly and essential for our work. Hey, I'd like to say something else about that. With, this is Tony again. When, when we got the uh, the grant that I was cur uh, that I was working under, we actually couldn't register people to vote. Like we could talk to them about it, but we couldn't physically register them to vote. So we actually went and partnered with other organizations within the city, the local NAACP, another organization called Greater Birmingham Ministries. And whenever we went out to get people engaged, we actually took them along with us just to make sure that we weren't crossing any lines according to what our grant said. We could. Great. So we have a question. That's, that's a, oh, uh, oh. Go ahead, Keely. Oh, I was just going to follow up on that. that um, I know someone had mentioned about lobbying restrictions in grants. Um, Private foundations are actually required to make sure that they don't earmark a grant for voter registration unless the organization meets these particular requirements. Um, that doesn't mean that an organization can't do voter registration with a grant. Uh, it just means that in the grant agreement it can't say, we agree these funds will be used for voter registration. So yeah, that, that is a little piece that can get complicated for C3s that want to do voter engagement. So Keely, there's a question that came in from um, a, a participant. Tim wants to know um, what strategies can be used to ensure that publishing candidates' questionnaires remain unbiased. Great. Yeah. Um, and I'm sorry if there's if there's an echo for me and my voice. I hope that the echo isn't affecting everybody else. Uh, for candidate questionnaires, sort of similarly to the candidate education, you want to make sure that you offer it to all candidates. Um, you want to make sure that the questions are on a broad range of issues. So we really usually recommend organizations partnering with each other. Just as Tony said, you know, he, he his um, AIDS Alabama was partnering with other organizations just to sort of pool their resources. Um, the same with a candidate questionnaire to get that broad range of resources and that sort of pressure on candidates to actually respond. Um, there are some other sort of facts and circumstances pieces. So for example, if only one candidate responds and there's only two candidates in the race, 
there's some ways to get around that and still publish it, but please feel free to reach out to me and I can talk you through your specific situation if you're considering doing a questionnaire. Thank you. Uh, and Tony, it looks like we have a question for you. Um, Laura wants to know, in terms of engaging um, felons for, to get engaged in the voter process, what are some of the best practices that you have adopted? Is that putting up a flyer? Do you do a, a question on the intake form, et cetera? Well, uh, one thing that we, I, the easiest way for me to do that was to actually uh, partner up with some re-entry programs. We have a couple of uh, re-entry programs for people who are leaving the, uh, the prison systems. So I was able to, to partner with them and develop a relationship in which um, I was able to, to talk to their people who were leaving. Uh, also, like I said, when I was doing the, um, the surveys at the local HIV clinic, just talking to people about their voting habits was very revealing, how to be very intrusive. But, you know, once we, I kind of developed relationships with people fairly quickly. So they, they really had no problem just talking to me about it. But just in case you don't have that type of personality, you know, asking people, you know, a question like, well, are you voting in the upcoming election? And then seeing what their answers were. If they say no, well, why not? Um, well, I just don't think voting is important. Well, everybody just votes are important. You know, and, and I would just develop a, a, like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. But there were also other people like with our peer programs, we have people who were uh, uh, formerly incarcerated, so they know people and we, you know, just kind of use their networks. Thank you. I also want to remind the participants that your lines are now unmuted as well, too. Um, so um, not just presenters, but all uh, participants in the webinar lines are unmuted. But you can also continue to submit questions through the chat box as well, too. And so. Max, there's a question for you from Patrick. He wants to know, for organizations who are short on manpower, what have you found to be effective strategies to engage young people through social media and mobilizing volunteers? Uh, so uh, on the social media side, I would definitely yeah. like um, yeah. posting good, uh, good art. Tomorrow, another fun day. Yes. All right. Um, I just want to remind folks that lines are now unmuted, so please remember to, if you're going to have background conversations, to mute your line. Uh, but yeah, so if you are, um, if you have any good articles to read on it um, or need uh, good things to read on it, um, also having Twitter power hours is a good thing to have um, on a social media on the social media side, making sure that like um, like maybe engaging a couple groups around you, but engaging other groups and other youth-based groups around it. I think that um, something that we can bring is some education around HIV and AIDS, and what they can bring is the youth force around it. So engaging them around it uh, to have them uh, able to help around it. So I think those are a good thing that we were able to do with Chicago Votes. But if you have any other organizations around you uh, that you can think of to, to bring in around that, that, that's a good opportunity as well. So it looks like we have another question um, in terms for from uh, Teresa in terms of she wants to know um, are there um, ACLUs that can help with restoring um, voter rights for for those who are just involved or for. Um, um, so the way that the ACLU, this is Matt, by the way, sorry. The way that the ACLU is structured, they are divided. There's national and then chapters of it in each of the states. Um, our local ACLU um, has helped people before, and is, this is an area that they're pretty passionate about. But from what I understand, different state ACLUs have different kind of focus areas, depending on what they feel the need in their state is. But for, and it depends on the state. Um, itself for the legal issues. So some states do not allow people to have their voting rights restored. Some states don't take it away at all, I believe. Um, that's very rare, though. Um, so I, but I would check in with them. I mean, probably because they have a lot of connections with uh, staff who are in, uh, so like lawyers and staff that are involved in the law. They would know either themselves what it is or who to kind of reach out to to figure out um, what that process looks like for their state. One other thing I'd like to add to that 
is even if your local or state ACLU can't help, it's a good idea to see what your particular state laws are uh, regarding uh, vote, uh, voting rights reinstatement because there are some states, like Mike said, who, who they just don't uh, take your take your voting rights. But uh, each state's laws are differently are different. So it would um, really be in your best interest to see what your particular state laws say about that. Ramon, this is Bill McCall. Um, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay, great. Um, so I, I'm just kind of curious uh, to find out, um, you know, if I, you know, we've heard a couple of uh, stories, uh, you know, of successes. I, I, I'm wondering if there are um, some specific st stories that uh, um, Keeley, um, Tony, or Max have that, you know, that that that, that that, that they can share as particular successes that uh, that they've really um, that they've been able to engage people with. Hey, it's Max. Um, we kind of just started our program, but I would say um, just being able to do the street teams and talk to people. Um, I think we've gotten uh, a couple of people registered. We've also done it at some of our events that we've already been having, um, and, and have people come by and do re voter registration and. Um, just voter votering uh, contact cards, like in, engaging them to remind them to go vote. Um, we've seen that that work well, um, mostly in like uh, like fun settings, fun evening settings um, that aren't like like heavy on alcohol, but just general like uh, evening settings, like uh, informationals. You can do them also at town halls. Um, we we had like a prep for love event um, that uh, another organization actually did it. Um, at one of them, and it, it just really worked out well for them. So using those type of uh, fun events that we're having around, if it's even HIV-related issues, but also ones that are that are not at all, um, just using those times to actually uh, connect with people is important. I was actually able to get about uh, probably about eight or nine people at least to the point where they completed their applications, and I know a few of them gotten their rights reinstated. They didn't really want to participate in the call, but I probably would have done more, but I ended up having some health issues last year that kind of kept me out for most of it. But I think the most important thing is to make sure that people know that they can get their rights back. I mean, a lot of people, and prior to doing this, I myself thought that once you became a felon, that your voting rights were gone and there was no way to get them back. So if I thought that, you know, imagine who the, the average person on the street with no knowledge of how um, the system works, you know, a lot of people don't put, don't engage in this because they just don't know that it exists. So, you know, whether it's using flyers, social media, I even did a couple of YouTube videos uh, when, I were, when I was having my seminars about it that um, they got people out. But people can't fix what they don't know. So, you know, they know that they can get it fixed. It, it gives them a little bit more hope and gives them a little bit more reason to try to get them reinstated. I also want to echo what Max said about um, taking about taking events in other spaces that you're already present at um, and the success that you can have from weaving voter engagement into that. Um, we already had booths at Pride this last um, Pride season, for example. And while folks were there in a setting that normally you think you wouldn't think to talk about voting because people are you know out drinking and having fun and they're kind of there to celebrate and got all the body glitter all over them, um, I just had the volunteers approach people and say, hey, you know, while you're stopping the booth, are you registered to vote? You know, there's an election coming up and getting some folks registered there, and we um, were able to get a good number of people as well. Thank you. Um, I wonder. One other quick question was, are there any horror stories? Are there things that uh, happened that you would avoid doing? And um, Keely, I don't know if you've got anything along those lines either. Hi, this is Keely. Um, 
I don't want to out anybody on this call, <laughs> but uh, I would say the, the biggest thing and what I really encourage and I hope people do is, is reach out to us before something happens. Reach out to us before five minutes, you know, the five minutes before you're going to put a press release out because that's what we're here for. Our services as far as technical assistance are free. So we're happy to walk through the rules for you to make sure that you don't get frenzied, you don't get nervous, you know, the, the minutes leading up to when you want to do something. So just uh, having a little bit of a longer timeline, I would say. And then the second thing not to um, make people feel uh, nervous about reaching out, but, you know, what I didn't mention before is, as everybody knows on this call, it is an, this is an, extraordinary election. It is an unusual election. Who knows what's going to happen? And with that has come just this heightened level of, of aggression from some candidates, from some candidate supporters. So, you know, really when we're thinking about doing those communications, uh, I think it's just something else to put in that equation that it's a little bit of a different kind of year. But Again, as far as the, the types of activities that were described today and the types of activities that people are talking about in the Q&A, all obviously, again, very C3 friendly. Just, just to piggyback on that point, Keely, I think that um, in terms of this being a really unusual election year, I think that um, for a variety of reasons, um, the electorate's uh, emotions are um, probably higher this election cycle than they have in, in previous years. But I also think that for those um, organizations which are on the webinar, um, we are seeing this trusted, um, trusted um, numerators, um, trusted known quantities with the constituents that we serve. And I think that we can really use this opportunity to really engage folks um, in voter registration processes. So again, I would encourage all folks to really tap to all of the experts who talked today to really start talking through about ways that you can dip your toes into really um, um, working with the constituents that you work with to get them registered to vote, to engage them in voter education, and hopefully to get them out to the polls this fall.